If you're looking for a metaphor to describe Trump's finances, I think I found the perfect one. Trump Plaza in Atlantic City was imploded today. People actually paid for front row seats to watch it. I'm going to read now from a piece in the Times describing Trump's casinos in New Jersey. Trump Plaza was the first of three casinos Mr. Trump owned before his gambling business in Atlantic City cratered and went bankrupt for good, leaving a trail of unpaid contractors and suppliers and a bad taste for the Trump brand. Now, I'm going to attempt, keyword here is attempt, to list all the money problems Trump is facing. But there are literally so many here, I'm going to probably leave some out. But let's begin and let's start with debt. Trump, he owns more than $400 million that we know of, and it's coming due within the next few years. It's an open question how he's going to be able to actually service the debt here or even borrow the funds. Deutsche Bank, it's been Trump's largest lender. He reportedly owes them more than $300 million, and now Deutsche is refusing to do any further business with the Trump organization. And other banks, not exactly lining up for the business. Debts are up, revenues down, and that appears to be the business model for Trump's companies as we speak. They raked in 40% less money last year than the year prior, and business plunged at his Doral property in Miami, the Trump International Hotel in Washington, Turnberry in Scotland, and even, yes, Mar-a-Lago. Now, to be fair, a lot of that was pandemic-related, but his brand has also become toxic, and that's definitely a major factor. All of the lost business... It was before Trump, I should note, was indicted or incited that deadly riot at the Capitol and left town in disgrace in the wake of January 6th. The Professional Golf Association pulled its 2022 championships from Trump's course in New Jersey. Take a listen to the head of the PGA explain why. It's become clear that conducting the PGA championship at Trump administer would be detrimental to the PGA of America brand, his problems travel. In New York City, they cancel Trump organization contracts worth $17 million a year for operating two ice skating rinks in Central Park, a carousel, and yes, a golf course. In the meantime, and this one I think arguably as significant as anything else, if not more so, Vernado Trust, one of the biggest real estate developers in the country, is looking for ways to cut Trump out of two buildings that he has a 30% stake into. I should mention, these are two of Trump's most valuable assets. But the Wall Street Journal reporting that buyers, they're not stepping up because they want no part of Trump. Let's bring in my guest to discuss Bill O'Connor. He's a partner focusing on commercial real estate at the law firm of Thompson and Knight. And, and Bill, thanks for the time. Uh, let's pick up the conversation with Vornado because uh, this isn't about politics. This isn't about a lot of things. This is about the bottom line. And Trump um, is, is a drag on business and People can't invest. And in this particular case, Bernardo, they'll hold 70% of the equity stake, I understand here. And if they want to squeeze Trump and dry up the revenues, they can. That's somewhat emblematic of the problems he's got across the board. The Trump name, more harm than good. Um, right. And I mean, and there's reputational risk with holding on to some of these properties that I'm sure Vornado's considering as part of their analysis of what the next steps are. They have a right to make a capital call. I as I understand it, under their organizational documents, that could put a lot of pressure on a junior partner like Trump. So, I mean, there's there's a lot out there. To that end, we see the pictures, people yanking the, the Trump name off the west side and other properties, Stanford now. I saw some of the pictures this week. In the end, that's the dirty secret, isn't it, Bill, that this is really more of a branding play that he's had, more so, you know, than, than an ownership stake. Sure, there are the golf properties, but we're talking about commercial real estate or residential real estate, moreover. You know, it, it was just the name. He wasn't the big stakeholder. If he doesn't have a name worth traveling with here, that's going to hurt. You have, you have to go back to the Gulf and Western building when they reskinned it and turned it into residential. That was the first time that the Wall Street developers, Galbraith and, and Riverbank, did analysis and saw that the Trump brand, the Trump name added value. And that became um, something we started to see over and over again in Stanford, New Rochelle, other areas where, you know, they thought they could get a premium price for residential condos by having the name attached to it. Um, and of course, those pay royalties to the Trump organization. So that was a it's a very effective model, right? It, the, you know, when the brand's good, it's like a Ritz Carlton or a Four Seasons. It it draws people. Um, when the brand sinks, people don't want to be associated with it. The partners who actually own the building 
want to step away from the brand, not unlike a failing hotel. And so they will strip the names off and, and try to use contractual obligations or moral turpitude clauses or similar clauses to, to terminate the relationships. And the other thing is, when you have the imprimatur of the presidency, um, and obviously you don't divest, you know, you have, if not leverage, you certainly have appeal to certain foreign nations. An ex-president, that goes away in a lot of cases, especially with the way the presidency ended. So even if his problems are domestic, they don't go away internationally either. That's right. Um, and, you know, it's political risk is something even foreign lenders or investors take into account. And whether that's going to, you know, result in a downgrade to their position. So it, it's, if, if there is perceived political risk or situational risk resulting from things like regulatory investigations, um, they're not going to want to. They're not going to want to wade into that necessarily to help bail out properties that owe a lot of money. And Bill, this may be a little inside baseball, but banks are flush with money. Interest rates the way they are right now, and the M and A divisions looking to do deals. To me, it is really telling um, that people aren't lining up to take the place of Deutsche Bank with these notes coming due for Trump. Um, they either look at them as somebody they don't want to associate the bank with or a risky investment. But either way, Trump's got a problem. Well, the, the other thing is that all of these loans require very, very transparent financial disclosure. And when you have a situation like um, the, the situation in, with the DA's office in Manhattan, where there is a dispute relating to financial disclosures, lenders are going to be very, very cautious about that. They don't want to have a regulator, you know, looking into their affairs because they're dealing with somebody whose financial disclosures are being subjected to that type of scrutiny. So, Bill, guess for me here, I'm not going to hold you to it. When the note comes due, he's got to pay the piper. What are we going to learn, you think? Um, I think we're going to learn that he, you know, the, his, the history with Trump, and I was tangentially involved with the Taj Mahal and its bankruptcy. The history that Trump, they're very astute at using the bankruptcy laws and restructuring laws to try to buy time. I think that is, is and that would be the right legal strategy um, in a situation where you can't get re refinancing. I, I think we could see that. You're right, but I think the optics, um, given that he wants to play in the political waters of having to declare bankruptcy, aren't going to play too well. Um, you know, maybe you can rationalize it, you know, when you're talking about restructuring, but, uh, you know, that's now into the second sentence of an explanation. I don't know how well that plays uh, to the cable news audience, those who think of him as a financial wizard. Could be. Uh, it will be fascinating. Hey, Bill, I appreciate a few minutes. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rich. Pleasure to be here. Okay, so we've talked the legal problems, the business problems. How about the political challenges? Uh, well, for a whole party, not just Trump. Up next, a lifelong Republican who is so fed up with Donald Trump hijacking the grand old party, he is part of a group talking about forming a third party that is a lot more like what the GOP used to be, the party of Reagan and Lincoln.